Good afternoon, Good afternoon. and thank and you thank for you joining us. Today, Today I'm excited to turn this to you, a webinar with Moral Sattar, who is the founder of Biblia Crux. And I'm hearing a lot of echo. Um, if somebody has their phone on or their mic on, could you please mute yourself? I'll give it just a second. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm really excited to introduce you. Ooh, I can do this. Moral? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you, do you hear, hear the echo? Yeah, I hear the echo. It wasn't. Oh, maybe. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe it's. I'm going to turn it to. Maybe it's the iPad. Okay, okay now. now. I still hear still the hear echo. echo. I apologize, we're having some technical, technical difficulties. The echo okay. is joy. Yeah, it's weird. Um, so I turned so off, I turned off, off the Y. The Let me Let try a different option. Awesome. Just a moment. Just a moment. Okay, let's see if this is better. Yeah, yeah, I think it's better. Okay. Yeah, so thank it's you for good to introduce um, to you today our guest speaker. She is the founder of BiblioCrunch. And what she is going to do today is present for us much better. Somebody said good. <laughs> what she's going to do is present for us a session called Avoid Common Self-Publishing Mistakes. But before we jump into that, I wanted to do a little housekeeping items. I um, wanted to talk to you about the way to communicate. Some of you have already figured this out. Angelique and Jay have. On the left-hand side of your screen, you see a chat functionality. Feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar, and we will respond to them at the built-in breaks that we have. Um, any other comments that you may have, feel free to, to put that information there as well. I also wanted to encourage you to take any profound thoughts or pearls of wisdom that you may hear during the session and socially share them. Um, you can see on the screen in front of you, and you might want to jot this down, uh, Moral Sitar and at Publish Me are the Twitter handles, and the hashtag at um, Bublish is the, the correct one to use. The other thing I wanted to tell you is at the end of the presentation, we will be publishing this and sending out an email to everybody um, to record, um, share the recorded session. Somebody has a phone ringing. Oh, sorry. That was me. Okay. So one of the things I also wanted to tell you before we get into introducing our speaker is a little bit about the company. Um, as I mentioned, Morale is the founder of BiblioCrunch. And basically, if you haven't been exposed to them, I really want to encourage you to check them out. They bring together a community of authors, curated publishing professionals, and readers. And really, what they like to compare themselves to is an Angie's List for quality author services. So be sure to take some time to check them out. Um, next slide, please. Oh, oh. I'm on. I'm on. Oh. You are. If you could just give me the next slide, please. Oh, okay. Awesome. So let me tell you a little bit about Morale. Morale, as I mentioned, is the founder of BiblioCrunch, but she's really smart. As you can see, she's got a, a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science. Everything has to do with computers and digital publishing, and she's been developing software forever. Um, but in addition to all of her accomplishments and, and how smart she is, I asked her if she'd tell me something 
um, interesting, some factoid that people might not know about her. And what I thought was really great was she really likes sci-fi. In fact, she's kind of a sci-fi junkie. She watches all the shows that nobody watches and they usually end up getting canceled, but that's her passion, her secret love. So <laughs> you're definitely in for a treat. Um, she's got a, a plethora of information to share. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Maral. Okay. Thanks so much, thanks Joy. So much, Joy. Um, um, and thanks and so much, thanks so much to, publish, to publish for having me having on. Me on. Uh, uh, hold on, I'm, hold on, I'm, seeing, I'm hearing it hearing echo it again. Echo. Okay. Okay. Uh, can, uh, can, is, okay. Is okay. The echo is bad, Maral. Um, try going. Hi. Hi. Is it, is it okay? Is it okay? Try use your try using your speakers on your computer and and muting your phone for a second. Okay, muting my muting phone. My phone. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hold on one second. That's weird. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I think the echo's gone now. I think we'll just stick to the computer instead of the call-in line. Um, okay, cool. So thanks so much, Joy, for having me. I'm really excited to be here, and thanks to the folks at Bublish. Um, I love Bublish. I love the idea of book bubbles, and I think it's a really great innovative company, and I'm so excited that you guys are doing educational webinars. Um, and now I'm just going to get started. Uh, I've been working in the self-publishing industry for four years. And like Joy said, before that, I used to work as an engineer. And then I went to grad school uh, because I was looking for different business models for magazines. And I don't know if a lot of you remember, but back in 2011, ebooks were frying off the shelves. Um, there were two events that I remember happening is in 2011. Will and Kate got married, and Osama bin Laden got captured. And if you were an Amazon Kindle uh, owner, you know you noticed that people were buying books um, off of Amazon by people who weren't experts for these topics, and these books were becoming bestsellers. So what I did is I pitched to my bosses at time, why don't we actually publish books? based on breaking news events. We have some of the best staff in the world. We have some of the best writers, the best editors between time, people, fortune, money, CNN. So what I did is I actually got an executive sponsor to actually um, to actually uh, host my project, and we pitched it around to everyone. And like any big corporation, they were slow to approve the idea. So by the time we did our first book, it was already out of the news cycle. So that's when I decided that I would leave. Uh, and that's when I recognized that there was a huge need in the book publishing space, and that's when I left to launch Biblia Punch. And that's what I've been doing for four years. And like Joy said, it's a marketplace that helps authors and publishers find talent to help them create quality books. All right, so I'll just go over the industry a little. The industry, before we talk about the self-publishing um, common mistakes, is just helpful to understand what how, the shape, how it's changed, um, and where it's kind of evolving right now. Uh, the book publishing industry has changed drastically, and I think it's one of the most exciting times to publish a book. I remember back in the day, I'm, and I'm from New York, and my husband and I live in New York with our daughter, and I remember telling him, I really want to move out of the United States into a developing country because I feel like every single software that's been invented has been invented. Every single social media platform that's been invented has been invented. And I kind of wanted to work on something from the ground up. And that's when I came across the book publishing industry. And I got really excited again about working on something. So just to give you an idea about numbers, digital publishing grew to 2.7 billion by 2013, which was nearly nine times larger than 2009. Ebook uh, unit scales actually help that growth, and ebooks actually bring in a lot of substantial revenues, especially for indie authors, and it's projected to keep on growing. Just to let you know how much the publishing industry has changed, you have everything from do it yourself authors to traditional publishers. 
And previously, like if you were publishing a book maybe 10 years ago, you had to, you didn't have very many options available to you. You had to go through a traditional publisher. And they were the traditional gatekeepers. They decided what books would get published. They decided who would get published and where it would get published. And they owned all the distribution. If they wanted a bestseller, they could buy ads on the subway. They would have front of placement in Barnes and Noble stores. But um, the self-publishing and the digital revolution kind of changed all that. So especially Amazon Kindle, the it just, they just made it really easy to download and purchase a book, and then the platform actually kind of disrupted the industry, basically. Oh, enunciate a little better. Sorry. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? All right. Is this better? About the publishing services spectrum? Should I speak a little louder? Okay, great. Okay. So just a little bit about the publishing services spectrum. There's a huge opportunity to fill an unmet need. You have traditional publishers who traditionally provided it all the services from professional editing, cover design, app development, marketing and publicity, fact checking, proofreading, converting it to digital formats, getting it ready for prints, enhanced features, proofing and distribution. And with the age of digital, um, a lot of these interactions are kind of segmented and now you can actually find some a Simon & Schuster editor. You can find a HarperCollins editor. You can find the person who marketed the bestseller book at Penguin Random House because they actually freelance a lot of their services now. So you have control over your book and you decide who you want to hire, who edits your book, and you kind of have the same opportunity that a traditional book does. Um, so freelance services are the future. So if you provide services or you're looking for services, you can actually just find tons of people. And BiblioCrunch is one of the places where you can find it. So just to quickly go over the self-pub stats, um, the big five traditional publishers now only account for about 16% of the ebooks on Amazon's bestseller list. Self-published books now represent 31% of ebook sales on Amazon's Kindle store. Indie authors are earning nearly 40% of the ebook dollars going to authors. Self published authors are dominating traditionally published authors in sci fi, fantasy, mystery, thriller, romance genres, but they're also taking significant market share in all genres. And this is from a report called Author Earnings, um, which is done in conjunction with a sci fi author, Hugh Howey. And just to give you about an idea about pricing. A lot of people previously didn't like that they felt that low price books were flooding the market. The 99 cent pricing days are kind of gone. What uh, the industry has kind of shared is content does have value. $2.99 and $3.99 are currently the pricing sweet spots for most ebook bestsellers. In general, authors who price their books modestly earn more than those who, whose average price is higher. And 99 cents is no longer the path to riches. So readers also prefer longer ebooks. In fact, best-selling books tend to be over 100,000 words, which is a huge, huge surprise. Series books actually outsell standalone books. Um, but when it comes to a series, books under 50,000 words are at a sales disadvantage. Free works as a good marketing tool still, especially when an author offers a first book in a series for free but it's much less effective than it was before because now everyone's kind of figured out that everyone's kind of figured out that these are the sites that you could advertise your free book on so now there's just now the problem is there's so many good books out there which one do you choose pre-orders are actually giving authors a sales advantage nonfiction books actually earn more at higher prices um, nonfiction buyers are less sensitive they care more about the actual content and learning from an expert. And if you want to look up some more data on this, uh, Smashwords has a great survey uh, that, and they actually up, they actually released all their information on pricing. Questions? No. I don't see that we have any questions at this point, so let's just move on to the next section. Okay, all right, great. 
Okay, now I'm going to launch, now that I've given you an overview of the publishing industry, uh, we're going to launch into the common mistakes. We've worked with tons of authors. We've helped a lot of authors become bestsellers. We've helped a lot of authors reach number one in the category. But some of the mistakes that they make are the same mistakes over and over again. So I'm hoping by sharing this information with, with you all that you're not going to make the same mistakes. So the first mistake. Not defining your budget and goals. A lot of times, self-published authors forget this key step and cost that up. You need to decide, are you looking for more readers or are you looking to sell books? Uh, for example, I had an author who wrote a family history. And in the beginning, I asked her, who is your target demographic? And she said, just I just want a book to document my life, my family's history. And I want to share it with the family members. And I said, okay, do you want to sell the book? She's like, no, I'm not really interested in selling it. I just want to document it. And I, I had read the book. And there wasn't anything that stood out or that would be of interest to anyone who's not a member of the family. But then by the time we had published the book and it was out, she got really excited and she wanted to market it. And it was a really hard book to market because the only people interested would be her family. So just make sure that you're clear up front um, what you want to do in the beginning. Also, it's very, very good to have a budget in mind. I had another author who came to us. She had spent $40,000 on editing services on five different editors, and she was just not going about with the right strategy. So just make sure you have a budget and you have your goals. Another thing that's gotten really popular is crowdfunding. And if you don't consider crowdfunding, you're actually kind of doing a disservice for yourself. And publishing can cost money, um, especially if you're looking for good editing, good cover design, if you don't already have a team. And one good way to actually raise money to fund your book is through the concept of crowdfunding. And crowdfunding is where you raise money through social campaigns. And the average author can raise anywhere between $2,000 to $10,000. And you don't have to give it back. You just give people incentives uh, for donating to your campaign. It could be a copy of your book, a digitally signed copy. I've seen some authors put an incentive. If you donate $5 to this campaign, I'll yell your name from the top of a rooftop and you know tweet you out on social media. And some of the platforms that I think are great are PubSlush. They do just crowdfunding for authors, Kickstarter, and Indiegogo. The only negative about Kickstarter is if you don't reach your full goal, you don't get the money. Indiegogo, you can actually raise money and keep however much uh, you get. Uh, but um, Maurice Christman said recently in an interview that one out of three publishing projects on Kickstarter actually get funded, so the numbers are really good. And the ones that don't get funded are the folks who don't market their stuff really well. Um, and just like book publishing, if you do a Kickstarter campaign or a PubSource campaign, Indiegogo campaign, you have to create a really fun video, and then just ask, share it on social media, and ask your community to help you support the book. So another mistake is not doing vendor research. Whether you're deciding between an editor, cover designer, vanity press, company, always make sure you do the research. A simple Google search of vendor name negative reviews will give you everything you need to know about a particular company editor or vendor. You can actually look up a lot of companies on Better Business Miro. Always read the terms of service or terms of use before signing up for a platform. A lot of them actually are not author friendly. And it doesn't matter if you're signing up for a big six or a startup. You should always, always read the terms to make sure you're not giving away the rights to your work. And this is just an example of a search term that I did. Bad reviews, name of the company, and as you can see, there's a lot of negative things about them. Questions at this point? Yes, um, actually we do have a couple. You were talking about goal setting. Um, is there a good formula to follow for setting goals? Uh, yeah, so make a list. Make a list of what you want to do. Uh, put like it could be a bulleted list. What I like to do is I just have the author jot down a few bullets and then analyze each bullet and then just put a date against it and work backward from that. So let's say you want your book to come out um, before springtime. 
in time, like before, so you can have enough time to market for Mother's Day. So you would actually put in launch before Mother's Day, reach out to, um, reach out to these blogs, make sure the book is ready by so and so day, and kind of do like the reverse timeline, and then work backwards from that. And that I've applied that to every single type of job that I have. I used to do that while I was a product manager at Time. I did that for my writing staff just creating the, the goals and the bulleted list with the dates against them is just something good. And then check it and refer to it every week to make sure that you're hitting your goals and your timeline. Awesome. Um, we do have one more question, but before I ask it, there has been a request that you go back to the last slide for just a second. I guess somebody's trying oh, yeah. to take notes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so while we're doing that, um, the other question was, you were talking about crowdfunding. Is there a step-by-step -step guide that you would recommend on how to successfully crowdfund? Oh yeah, there's actually a book by, um, it's published by Aditya. It's called, it's, we actually have a bunch of guides on BiblioCrunch and there's a book um, by a press called Aditya called How to Successfully Crowdfund. So I would definitely check those out. Okay, actually. Oh, and also for anyone, Oh, sorry. Can you go back one more slide? Oh yeah, sure. Also, just just so you just so you all know, um, I'll sh you I'll share the slides with everyone, and the code for getting the slides will be on the last second to last page. So everyone who wants a copy of the slides can get a copy of the slides. So. Awesome. Now, you know, since you did bring up BiblioCrunch, I've I've had um, one person in particular that keeps pinging me with questions about BiblioCrunch and your services. Um. A, could you just pause for a second? I know it's in the middle of our presentation, but the time seems right. Yeah. And and just tell them what it costs to be a member and then what the range of services cost internally. Those are questions that have been pinging at me while we've been going. Oh, yeah. yeah. So to become a member is free. You can become a member uh, just to access the free services. And what you get access to is you can actually you get your free profile. If you're an author, you can actually connect your books to Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, and then you can also host contests and giveaways as an author and engage with other community members. You could post your projects and get proposals. So let's say you have a cover design for your fantasy vampire book. What you would do is you'd say, I'm looking for a cover designer. My budget is $500. Um, and then an email goes out to all the people who match that criteria, and they submit their proposals directly to you. So uh, we actually take a transaction fee from the freelancer. And then also, if you're looking um, to be a paid member, we actually have a VIP service, which includes our author academy, which has all our instructional videos. We have, our, we have sample marketing plans, sample business plans, and tons of templates that you can actually download and use. And we also have a VIP support system um, where you can email or call us and we'll kind of guide you through the publishing process and the steps that you need. And we actually have a code for that um, where you can sign up for a dollar with the code VIP15 for the monthly membership. So awesome. you can just go to our website. Great. I think we're done with, oh, we have one more question. Do they charge both the editor oh, and yeah, the sure. author? No, just the editor. Okay, I think we're good to go if you want to kick back into the presentation. Okay, great. All right. So the next thing that you want to make sure is, is you want to make sure you hire a good editor. And like I mentioned before, we had an author come to us and she had spent $40,000 in editing service. She didn't really make a good budget. She didn't really like the way that she worked with them. So one of the ways to make sure that you work well is make sure you hire a work an editor who has worked in your genre. Make sure the editor has worked with a self-published author because a lot of times editors assume that you know all the stuff about the contract, how many revisions are included, when in actuality you might not know. Um, ask a lot of questions. Agree on a fee structure. Is it 15% to do a certain amount of the book or 50% deposit? And also make sure you sign a contract via email or document. Just agree on the terms and also the timeline on I'd like a book edited within three months, two weeks, whatever. And then make sure you meet with your editor. And, I, and, I, and when I say meet, I mean that term loosely. 
you can meet on Skype, Google+, uh, FaceTime, um, talk to them on the phone, just as long as they've kind of edited a sample for you and you've gotten feedback about it and you're comfortable with the way that they present their feedback. And then there's two types of editors, main editors. There's developmental editors and then there's copy editors for books. Developmental editors actually reshape or they might rework your whole manuscript. They'll change your wording. They'll move stuff around and make sure that it's like a cohesive whole. Copy editors actually will make sure to check for typos, to make sure you're using the same thing consistently, and, you know, kind of to make sure everything is consistent. The next thing is a lot of authors, what they don't do is they don't optimize their covers. And when it comes to cover design, you need to make sure it's optimized for all e-readers, devices, and retailers. So you need to make sure it's optimized um, on for your iPhone and remember like the iPhone thumbnail is so small that you need to make sure that the cover your byline and the picture are clear on there and a lot of people still use black and white Kindles so make sure your cover is optimized for black and white uh, so just keep in mind and right now there's so many simulators and tools that you can actually do that without having to do so much work uh, size of 1600 pixels by 2400 pixels in JPEG works for all digital books when you work with a designer, check their portfolio. Make sure they've worked in your genre before and that you like their designs. If you're going to use custom illustration or stock photo, um, custom illustrations cost a lot more. You can actually buy a stock photo and put it on your cover design. Just make sure you get the right rights. It's less expensive. Don't just hire a graphic artist or a print book designer. Make sure that they've done digital books and ebooks. And also, just while you're browsing cover designs, a good way to just kind of um, get into the nitty-gritty is go on to Amazon and just kind of browse the ones that you like and then send them the ones that you think kind of show how you'd like your cover to be and that actually makes it a lot cheaper a lot faster and same as in editing make sure you agree on a fee structure and um, and deposit structure and that you have a contract signed with them too the next thing is ISBNs so the thing about ISBNs the mistake that a lot of people think is they assume that you need one and they don't really know that much about them. These are the barcodes that register your books. Most retailers don't require them to self-publish anymore. Um, but however, if you do have an ISBN, it can up your Google rank. It helps with library distribution. And if you do get them, get one for every format, EPUB, MOBI, and PDF. The official distributor in the United States is Bowker, and one ISBN is $125, 10 ISBNs is $250. So just make sure you do your research. Uh, if you're not planning on doing library distribution and you kind of just want to get your book out there, you can cut out this cost. But just make sure you think about whether you do want an ISBN or not. The next um, piece is formatting and conversion. Uh, it's pretty straightforward if it's just text with no bullets, pictures, or illustrations you could convert straight from a Word document. Picture books are more complex uh, if you're doing like a photo book. There's also tools, which we'll talk a little bit more later. Charts and graphs add to the complexity of a book. Just remember, when you're formatting your book, um, the thing that people often forget is they'll just look at it on one, like on their iPad app, but they need to keep in mind, you need to keep in mind that your book's gonna flow differently on your iPhone, it's going to flow differently. On your iPad, it's going to flow differently. On your Nook and your iPhone. And just make sure you um, use all the tools to preview how it looks. And then also, you can do a lot of this by yourself. But if you're going through a third party or hire someone, same deal. Have a contract, decide on a fee structure, and agree on a sample schedule. Um, one mistake that a lot of authors make is once it comes back, and even if you've hired some from someone, you need to make sure that you either hire a proofreader for your book or you do proofread your own book. It's your book. Make sure you go through it on a digital device or simulator before putting it onto the market. Even if you hire someone, they might make a mistake. I think I heard somewhere that the average ebook has 50 to 100 errors. All the retailers, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, iBooks, Kobo, let you preview your book online. And you want to make sure you catch the errors before it goes onto the world. Um, if I don't know if all of you remember, but when the Steve Jobs biography was published, uh, they actually did not proofread the book. And what happened is you couldn't actually resize the text 
um, in your readers. So that made a lot of readers angry. And if they had just hired a proofreader to just test it, they could have, you know, saved lots of time and lots of money. And so they had to pull their book off the market, reformat it, and then they uploaded it back again. Another thing, another mistake that authors do is they do print runs. And a lot of people ask us this, but the thing is you don't want to do a, a print run and you don't want to pre-print books unless you already have a distribution deal in place with someone. Uh, two good tools as CreateSpace and Lightning Scores for good print-on-demand services. Like basically what they'll do is when someone buys your book, that's when the book gets printed. So you won't have a thousand books sitting in your garage or 500 books like some authors do because they just assume that if they buy them, people will, uh, if they print them, people will buy them. But that's usually the backwards way of thinking about it. Another thing that authors do is when they start reaching out to press or media, they don't have any reviews. So what you want to do before your book is published, um, you want to send free copies of your digital book to encourage reviews. Before you execute any type of marketing plan, I always say make sure you have at least 10 reviews. There's great services like NetGalley where you can actually sign up as a member and then get reviews um, from actually validated reviewers on there. And then also there's a list of free blogs where you can send your book to reviewers on our blog as well. Any questions at this point? Yes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, early on, you mentioned optimization, and the question is, what does optimized mean? Um, for your cover? Yeah, it was, it was back several slides. I think the, the concept as a whole, just optimizing something, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, just, uh, just making sure that, oh, I, I mentioned it in terms of optimizing your book cover. That just means that making sure it's in the best condition possible. So if you're designing a cover, um, you want to make sure that it looks good on an iPad. You want to make sure it looks good on a Barnes & Noble screen. You want to make sure it looks on a black and white device. Uh, different people have Samsung phones um, and iPhones, and the mobile phone is actually turning into people are reading more and more on their mobile phones so you have to think that when people's your first chance that you get to people it might be their mobile phone so you want to make sure that it's optimized meaning the title of your book is legible <clears throat> the name of the author is legible and the cover is legible so that's what I mean about optimizing making sure that your cover is best presented in all screens and all formats Awesome. We do have a couple more questions, but we also have a request for you to go back to the free blog website. Okay, free blog website. Okay. There you go. Um, so when you talk about an ISBN, we've had several questions surrounding that, starting with, you know, how do you get an ISBN? And then also asking, what is the difference between using my own ISBN or letting the publisher use theirs? Okay, so just so you all know, um, there's only one distributor, there's one official distributor for ISBNs in the United States, and that's a company called Bowker. So you want, if you are going to use ISBNs, you want to get the ISBNs through Bowker. And there might be other companies um, that let you buy ISBNs in bulk, and so they might charge you $25, $10 to buy the ISBNs, but then the disadvantage of that is you will show they'll they're the publisher not you but if you buy your own ISBN and you have a bunch of books or you plan on publishing a bunch of books they will be published um, you can create a press or a company and all your books will be published under that so you'll be the publisher uh, and then also you having the ISBNs you just have more control over them because you can modify them directly in Bowker you can update your metadata yourself, you don't have to rely on someone else. So if you are going to get ISPNs, you should buy them directly. So the question, um, when you use Bowker, I've gotten several people chatting here asking for the URL for Bowker, and they've thrown in several suggestions. Do you happen to know that URL? Yes, yeah, myidentifiers.org. Awesome. So, a statement was made by Sharon, and, and I'll make that statement, and then we'll just move on to the next thing. She said that Bowker is now requiring only one ISBN for digital, no longer different ones for Mobi and EPUB. Okay. Um, um, the question from Angie. I would still, 
Go ahead. Um, I would still use a different one, but even even so, that's the thing. Not everyone requires it, but um, it, it's up to you. So. Okay. Um, I guess the the next question is from Angelique, and she says, "What kind of copies do you send for review, and in what format?" It's up to the so. Um, you should actually check with the the reviewer. They'll usually have guidelines on their blog or on their Twitter page or anything. So it's their preference. So if they want a print book, you should send them a print book. If they prefer eBooks, you should send them an eBook. So it's totally up to the reader. It's totally up to the reviewer because they're doing you a favor by reviewing your book. You're not paying them to do it. They wanted to know what about copyright? Oh, copyright. Yeah. So copyright, um, uh, copyright, you can go copyright.gov. I mean, technically, you're protected the minute that you write the work, but you can actually just register your work for copyright for 35 bucks online, and I recommend everyone do it if you can afford the $35. Awesome. Okay, I think that's all we have for okay. questions. So if we kick back to the presentation. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good thing. Um, I'll add that to my next time I do it to include copyright. Um, just to quickly overview um, the major retailers uh, and give everyone like a quick breakdown. These are the ones that actually these are the largest ones, and they allow you to self-publish your eBooks. There's Amazon for your Kindle. There's Barnes and Nobles for your Nook tablet. There's iBooks for your iPhone, iPod, iPad, and then there's Kobo for your Kobo reading device. And what you want to do, um, some people might disagree with me, a lot of designers prefer designing the book in InDesign and then converting it to the different formats, but only if you're an experienced InDesign person. So I think you should take a Word document and then it's your clean file and then you can actually convert it to EPUB, PDF and the Kindle version of Mobi. And also, a lot of retailers actually now accept Word documents, but you want to be careful um, with this because you want to make sure that it's formatted exactly how you want or that you use a reliable template because it might look drastically different on different versions of the ebook. So I recommend formatting it for that file type. And just to quickly go over file types, there's Mobi PRC, which is Amazon's proprietary format. There's EPUB. Um, Barnes and Nobles, Nook Press, Apple iBooks, Kobo Use, and then there's a print-ready PDF. Um, you can actually do a print-ready PDF with CreateSpace and Ingram Spark and anywhere that you do that takes print files. Also, when you're validating your book, there's different there's different tools. Um, there's a tool called Bookworm. It reads EPUBs online and validates them. Um, and the value of doing this is you can actually catch the errors before you upload your book. So let's say you have an EPUB file and you want to upload it to Barnes & Nobles and iBooks and Kobo. And usually when you upload it, it'll tell you your file has so-and-so errors. But if you validate it before, you can kind of avoid that whole step and just upload it. Um, there's EPUB validator, there's Sigil, which is open source, and there's EPUB check. Um, just to give a quick overview of Amazon, it's known as KDP, Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing, and the link is right there. They own over 60% of the market. 25% of revenues on Amazon come from self-published titles in US. It might be a little higher now. You need a PRC or Mobi file. The cover, 1,000 pixels on longest size um, with 1.6 height to width ratio. And um, the thing with page numbers is you don't want to hard code them if you're doing an uh, ebook because Ebooks are not based on page numbers, they're based on location. So the page number will be, the location will be different on your iPhone versus your iPad. And to sell your book, you'll need to submit your tax and bank information. And a lot of people actually don't have this stuff sorted out in the beginning. So just make sure that this is correct because if, if it's launch day and you don't have that information in there, you're not going to be able to sell your book and they won't accept it. Barnes and Nobles, they're known as Nook Press. Uh, for, they were, their self-publishing platform is called Nook Press. They used to be called Pubit. Um, it's roughly 25% of the ebook market. You'll need to upload an ePub file. 
um, cover size optimal between 750 and 2000 and to sell your book, same deal, you need to submit your tax and bank information. iBooks, Apple iBooks, roughly 25% of the ebook market. Um, you need an EPUB file. If you're looking to add idio video or audio to your book, it's great for enhanced books. Um, there's iBooks Author, which is actually a really easy tool to use if you want to just do an enhanced book for iBooks. Cover size, same deal as the others. To sell your book, you need to input your bank and tax info, and you need a Mac and an iTunes Connect account, and you'll need to download iTunes Producer if you want to upload directly. Um, Kobo Writing Life uh, is really big internationally. Uh, you'll need to upload an EPUB file, and to sell your book, you need to input your bank and tax information. And before someone points it out, I know the numbers don't add up to 100% for market share. Those are just general estimates that um, that are kind of extrapolated from all the data. No one actually shares their actual market share. And if you don't want to upload directly, there's distribution platforms um, where you can actually upload your book in one place and then distribute through all the stores and libraries. And there's two main places right now. There's draft to digital and there's smash prints. All right, so I guess we'll break for another question. Awesome. We have several questions. Um, the first one, you were talking about not hard coding the page numbers, but if you have a table of content yeah. and you don't, don't hard code the page numbers, how do you use a table of ebook? Oh, in the ebooks, it's you make it dynamic. So it'll actually, like, if the tool will actually generate it for you automatically. So it'll actually save the location. So you actually don't go to the page. Okay. You actually don't page number it's it's it'll automatically generate it for you and when you click on it when most tools do it'll go to chapter one or whatever so you just have to link it up to the right place so you don't actually put the physical page numbers unless it's a print book okay um stacy wanted to know what do you mean input your bank and tax info oh just like any any sales site if you make money you have to sub uh, they need a place for you to deposit your money to, and they do need to make sure that you're compliant. Um, so let's say you make, and I think for a lot, if, if you make over $600, oh, I'm not 100% sure what the number is, but for freelancers, if you make over $600 a year, um, you have to report the income. So it's just a way for them to report your income. So they have a place for you to put your business um, tax ID or your personal tax ID, and they need a place for you to deposit the money when you do start making money on your book. Right. So a lot of times people, for tax info, they would use their Social Security number, which is really probably not advisable. You, you probably should get a different number that identifies you, right? And yeah, yeah, like an EIN. Yeah. And the thing is, it's an online platform, and all online platforms, no matter how secure they are, might be hackable. So you just want to be safe. Right. So if you Google EIN, that acronym, you can actually get your employee identification number. Um, along that same vein, Jay Schwartz wanted to know regarding bank info, can we use a personal savings account or is it better to open a business account? It's up to you. Um, if you can manage, a lot of people actually have separate business accounts um, to store all their information. Some people actually when their book started making money, they opened the business account just to keep track. As long as you can keep track of the information and it's easy for you to keep track of the information, um, that's how you should do it. So if you're a freelancer, a lot of freelancers have separate accounts. Um, so, I mean, I have a separate account for my business stuff. So it's just easier for me to track that way. Awesome. Angelique but it's mostly personal. Yeah, right, right. Um, and Angelique wanted to know, where do people get Kobo books? Oh, um, the Kobo store. Kobo online, kobo.com. Okay. They and used to be they used to be in stores, but borders shut down. So now now you can only get them online and in Canada. Awesome. Um, I actually have gift cards from Borders, and they're no good anymore. <laughs> So, um, what are the two accounts to download to all ebooks again? And that's from Barbara. 
two accounts to download all ebooks. Um, I'm not sure if I follow the question. I think you, you mean were, the program. I think you were talking. Yeah. If, if I heard you correctly, I think you mentioned that instead of having to go to each individual distributor, that there was there were places oh, that you could go that would do it one upload and it would do it for you. Yeah, uh, Smashwords and Draft to Digital. Is that numeral two? But, yeah, Draft to the number two digital. And the thing with those is they're great. Um, you just upload once and it'll go everywhere. But just remember that they take a royalty on top of the ones that the retailers already take. Okay, and then Risa said, how do we get copies of these webinar pages? I think you shared that once already, oh, uh, your slides, but go ahead and-, and uh, Yeah, you can actually text 3344, or text the word BC slides to 33444 and it'll get sent to you. And that slide- uh, I'll show, I'll show you the slide. Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. That slides at the end of the presentation. And then as I stated at the top of this webinar, we're actually recording it. So every person that's here, you're gonna get a an email from me once we've posted it where you can download it and you'll be able to, to revisit it, the information there as well. Um, Jay said, uh, let me see what this is. Can you do a print screen and capture screenshots and then paste into Word? I guess when you're trying to create your ebook. What would you be taking screenshots of? He didn't clarify. Jay, if you can add some color, I'll be happy to ask that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure why, what circumstances you would do that. Okay. Um, I think those are the only questions we have for now. Oh, I'm sorry, these screenshots. Um, Jay said these screenshots as far as the presentation. You don't need to do that, Jay. She's going to give you the whole deck later, so you'll be good. Um, let's dive back in. I know you've got more content and we're running short on time, so we're going to okay. close the questions for right now, and um, we'll open up more questions here in a little bit. Yeah, we're actually at the end now, so we're good. Um, so another mistake that a lot of authors make is they don't have a marketing plan or PR strategy. And you need to make sure you have a marketing plan because books don't sell themselves and you're actually going to spend a lot of time marketing your book. Um, if you hire someone, make sure they've marketed books in your genre. I actually had someone who almost hired um, someone who was going to charge them $5,000 to do social media and Twitter for their book. And I said, well, have they, do they have any bestsellers under their belts? Um, what experience do they have in books? Um, and you know, are they well known? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, go back and ask her. And then she asked her and the person actually didn't have any experience. So she decided not to use her. So we like saved her like $5,000 a month. Um, get a success of their success stories. Uh, Sandra Beckwith, who's an ASJ member has a great newsletter. Penny Sensiveri has a great newsletter. Publish is a great platform for actually just getting your book discovered and discovery is a huge challenge a lot. When you're working with a marketing person, figure out whether they do blog tours, press pickups, launch parties, Amazon optimization. A book that I really like is How to Get Noticed and Get and Sell More Books by David Gagran. Um, and also, when you put together a marketing plan, just come up with a bulleted list. Um, these are these are your these. This is when you're going to do things like my book is going to be completed. Complete my book. Um, publish the book, reach out to bloggers, get reviews from XYZ, goals to have TV, and then just put um, put dates against it. And that and that's your marketing plan. So just make sure you have one. Um, we actually have a marketing plan on our site too. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me about how you can get access to that. Um, and a lot of companies try to sell marketing services. So just be wary since if someone is charging you $10,000 to market your book or $20,000 to market your book, just make sure that you understand what they do. I mean, if they, if they guarantee you a spot on TV, then they're probably not the right person because no one can guarantee you a spot on TV. It's they pitch the book and people will accept it or not. And also just a note about bestsellers. 
book sales are tough. Launching a book is like a new business. The numbers behind the data, uh, the numbers behind book data are not consistent. Um, according to Library of Conference, the Library of Congress, the average self put book sells 150 copies a year, and the average traditional book sells 250 copies a year. So just the book business is hard. So, but making sure you have your ducks in a row, that it's well edited, that you have a good marketing plan, good strategy, good budget. Um, all the tools to self-publish a great book are available to you, and you actually have the power and the control to actually publish an awesome book. So, um, just a few additional resources. Uh, Biblioprints.com, which is the marketplace that I run. We have 20,000 authors and about 1,200 vetted professionals that you could choose to hire. Our self-publishing tips blog is Biblioprints.com slash blog. I also write um, a column for PBS on self-publishing articles. And we also have a self-publishing soft line. And also, this is the slide that everyone was asking about. Um, if you send a text to 3344 with the word um, nano, oh, actually, that's the wrong word. Hold on. Free books. Um, you'll get our free books uh, sent directly to your email. And if you want a copy of the slide, Send the text uh, to 3344 with the word BC slides, and it'll give you instructions on how to do it. Um, my Twitter, if you want to get in touch with me, is Moral Sitar, at Bibliocrunch, and that's my About Me profile. And I don't know if I gave my email to you already, but it's morale at bibliocrunch.com. And also, um, August 5th, Publish is going to be doing how to accelerate your book marketing success. And this is just my information again. And if anyone has any questions, feel free. Now's your chance. I think we have eight minutes left. <laughs> yeah, so we do have a, another question. Um, Jay wanted to know, what are your thoughts about book agents? Book agents? Um, right now, if you want to publish traditionally, um, an agent is a good route um, on the West Coast agents are actually becoming publishing managers so the role of an agent is kind of changing uh day to day because before when you had people what before the only way to get published was through an agent and then the agent would pitch your book to a traditional publisher but now if your book does well on a platform like the publishers notice and they're actually on all these sites so the role of an agent is definitely evolving so and it's more for traditionally published authors versus self-published authors. Awesome. Well, I'm going to um, talk to you guys about a couple things while I'm doing this. If you have any questions, this is the time to, to go ahead and put them into the system. Um, and I'll ask them to Moral. But I wanted to thank you, Moral, for, for taking time to, to speak to us today. And actually, if you could go back to that slide one more time, the last slide. Um, she mentioned that we do have a webinar coming up on August the 5th. We have this webinar at the first of every month. We have two webinars a month at Bublish. The first one is always on how to accelerate your book marketing success with Bublish. And if you haven't had an opportunity to try that out, I strongly suggest that you go to Bublish.com and you'll notice that you can take a free 30-day trial, no credit card required, and learn many tips and tricks on how to accelerate your book marketing success. She was talking about marketing plans. There's a webinar on our website that I've actually given on the consistency, the power of consistency of marketing. We educate you on how to successfully market, and it's, it's a really affordable resource and tool that we have for you. Um, the information on how to register for this upcoming webinar will be sent in the follow-up email that I send to you. So be looking for that in your inbox sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, we do have, while I was talking, a few questions that came in if you want to go back to that other slide so they can write that information down. Um, the question is, um, Moral, if you'd like to go back to that other slide. Did I lose you? There you go. So which slide? The the one that says get our slides and free ebook. Um, Rhoda said that she texted three three four 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 and it said lead digit identifier not recognized. Oh, the free books has to be one word. Okay, thanks. Good to know. And they, 
Jay said, any thoughts on how to keep track of sales through Amazon? Do they tell you? Um, there's tools. There is a tool called Tracker Box. And they actually compile all your sales for you. You can, you can, it's called trackerbox.com and it's a really good thing in there. Awesome. And then Angelique, she wanted to know when they send the request through their phone, how do they actually get the slides? Oh, did you, did she, Angelique, did you already send the text? So if you text 33444 with the word BC slides, it'll say send us uh text your email and they automatically get sent to you okay awesome um i think those are all the questions that we have right now so thank you very much for um this presentation and we are really excited to have everybody join us and i wish you a very good day Okay, thanks so much, Joy. Thanks, everyone. Great questions.